Chapter One of Aesop in Rhyme with Some Originals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Noel Badrian. Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor. The Oak and the Reed. The thunder roared, the wind was high, and vivid lightning filled the sky, when an old oak, whose aged form ere now had witnessed many a storm, had borne the brunt and still withstood the wind, the lightning, and the flood, was torn up from his roots at last by one tremendous wintry blast then headlong to the stream descended his ancient pride and glory ended the ample waters soon conveyed the oak tree from his well-known shade then unknown naked hills were seen with rude and dreary wilds between and by the river's oozy edge grew weakly reeds and languid sedge strange thought the oak permit the fable that plants so slender should be able thus to survive the stormy day which made my stubborn limbs give way a reed just bending with the storm then to the oak inclined its form and thus it whispered aged friend i do not break because i bend i find it best while troubles last to bow beneath them till they're past thus spoke the trembling reed and ceased for now the windy storm increased then to the earth it bowed its head proving the truth of what it said meanwhile the oak with quickened sail was hurried onward by the gale and scarce had time allowed to say you're right ere he was borne away of moral here there's little need since that was furnished by the reed. End of The Oak and the Reed Chapter 2 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Padrian The Fox and the Lion when the fox and the lion first happened to meet, poor Reynard fell down at his majesty's feet, so great was the terror inspired. But the next time he met him, not quite so afraid, when the lion approached an obeisance he made, and after his health he inquired. But the third time he met him, old crony, said he, pray whither so fast, I must say to be free, that you're grown somewhat cool and unkind. The dignified lion deigned not a reply, but taking the fox to a river hard by, cooled him both in body and mind. Moral, thought the fox whilst emerging in woebegone state, this comes of one's making too free with the great. End of The Fox and the Lion Chapter 3 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Frogs. Some frogs within a bog or ditch, I really cannot tell you which, yet I prefer to say a bog, for that you know best rhymes to frog. These frogs, as Aesop's muse doth sing, requested they might have a king. So Jupiter, in a merry mood, straight threw them down a log of wood. But who can say how much it splashed, or who was frightened and who was mashed? Surprised that such should be the case, nor liking much this act of grace, they kept aloof a day or two, for fear of what he next might do. But see how still he lies, said they, let's go and hear what he will say. So they approached the royal log, 
and there was one courageous frog who leapt upon him to inquire what was his majesty's desire but he of course no answer made so they concluding he was dead petitioned jupiter again who quickly sent them down a crane this gracious prince to all the nation then issued forth a proclamation in which the greatest and the least were all invited to a feast and so on the appointed day legions of frogs stopped up the way now said the king upon this log is spread our feast and any frog who to jump on may not be able i'll raise him gently to the table enough was said for every guest around the monarch's person pressed the king then made a gracious bend to help his subjects to ascend but so it was as aesop wrote he let them fall straight down his throat while those below thought all was right although their friends were out of sight till one who something wrong suspected leapt up and so the fraud detected who can describe his feelings then my tongue cannot nor can my pen scarce was he up ere he was down and made the whole transaction known enough was said for every frog ere he had ceased forsook the bog croaking and groaning as they went for their old form of government moral this fable phaedrus did relate referring to affairs of state but leaving politics alone till we're a little older grown twill be a safer way for us to take the author's meaning thus that folks well off should be content nor make a change they may repent end of the frogs Chapter Four of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Solar Phenomenon. An astronomer gazing, as oft he had done, through a very long telescope aimed at the sun descried on a sudden a spot on his face so large as to darken one third of his rays o newton o haley were ye but alive what name to this monster i ask would you give like no other spot on his disc does it seem as maculae faculae neither of them but what do i see the phenomenon moves and there are its legs too which certainly proves that it must be an animal awful indeed for its length half a million of miles must exceed if so then the question must needs be decided which has for so long all the learned divided for now tis as plain as the nose on my face that the sun is in truth an inhabited place oh all ye philosophers moralists sages who have puzzled your brains on this subject for ages old thales copernicus newton descartes draw near if you can and the truth i'll impart he ceased but he scarcely an ending had made when the shades of those worthies his summons obeyed and in low hollow voices demanded in haste for what reason he'd called them and broken their rest oh indeed are you come said our hero surprised why i did not suppose as you all had demised what i said could have reached you but as it is so forthwith i'll proceed the huge monster to show so saying to each he the telescope handed and quickly of each his opinion demanded said newton that there is some creature i own but i do not believe it exists in the sun nor i said copernicus thales and all in fact we believe tis no wonder at all then pray said our hero explain what you see and say what you take this appearance to be 
said Newton, unscrew the last lens from your glass. The astronomer quickly obeyed, and, alas, for his fame and his theory, what should he descry when he opened the end of his tube but a fly? Moral Examine them well ere you speak of new wonders, twill save you from many ridiculous blunders. End of the Solar Phenomenon Chapter 5 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian the compliant farmer an honest farmer and his son were driving once an ass to town but wishing not to tire the brute they would not ride but walked on foot well said a man who soon they met i ne'er beheld such nonsense yet why should ye walk why don't ye ride pray what's a donkey for beside right said the farmer son arise and take our worthy friend's advice the duteous son obeyed with haste and soon bestrode the unwilling beast scarce had he mounted when behold two women next began to scold you lazy boy at once they cried why don't you let your father ride true said the father son get down i'll ride and you shall walk to town the son dismounted honest ned and let his father ride instead once more they sped them on their way and met a party come said they your legs are longer than your son's suppose you let him ride for once good said the father son you see there's room enough for you and me get up behind once more the sun bestrode the beast and journeyed on again they sped again they met a party not contented yet said they have pity on your beast and one of you get down at least but our good farmer thought at last he e'en would profit by the past nor change again unless indeed in one opinion all agreed moral although opinions vary so tis hard the right from wrong to know and never would the labour cease of studying every man's caprice yet some there are in which we see the wise and good do all agree let their opinions be your own and let what they advise be done End of The Compliant Farmer Chapter 6 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Two Vessels I'll tell you a tale two vessels set sail without either captain or crew your wonder to settle they were a brass kettle an earthenware porringer too oh dear said the latter friend what is the matter the kettle demanded at last said the pitcher i think i shall certainly sink i am filling with water so fast oh be not afraid i will lend you my aid hook on to my spout said the kettle said the pitcher oh dear it is you that i fear since if we come nigh of the blow i must die for i'm earthen but you are of metal moral as weak folks oft suffer by strong ones i say that the weaker had better keep out of their way End of The Two Vessels Chapter 7 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Bear and the Hermit. Once a bear had a thorn in his foot, as they term it, which it seems was extracted from thence by a hermit. So the beast felt so grateful and pleased with the dervis that he offered to enter quite into his service. So the hermit consented at length to the plan. Now then, thought the bear, I must do what I can to make myself useful and glad I shall be if a service in turn shall be rendered by me. Not long after this, as the hermit was sleeping, and the bear was the watch with great vigilance keeping, on the nose of the former alighted a fly. Oh, now, thought the bear, my best skill I must try. So he lifted his paw and completed the process, but crushed with the fly his poor patron's proboscis. Up started the hermit, Base villain, said he, is this the reward for my goodness to thee? The bear felt confounded as any one would, but explained the transaction as well as he could. Well, be sure, said the hermit, when next you kill flies, if on me they alight, just to ask my advice. For I'd rather have fifty of them on my nose than one of your friendly but terrible blows. Moral. Let us always take heed when we render a service that we serve not our friend as the bear did the dervis. Some ills had much better we know be endured than the pain or the danger of having them cured. End of The Bear and the Hermit Chapter 8 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Clown Praying to Hercules. An ancient Roman you must know, I think his name was Cicero, wishing to make his garden smarter, bespoke some gravel of a carter. But that had many miles to come to reach his seat at Tusculum. And then, besides all this, the way was quite knee-deep in miry clay. The horse was lame, the cart was crazy, and, worse than all, the man was lazy. If so, you'll say, I am afraid that Tully's job will be delayed. Exactly so. The cart, at length, was fixed beyond the horse's strength. In vain the driver groaned and grumbled. Down in the mud all fours he tumbled, and there for nearly an hour he lay. Thought he, to Hercules I'll pray, and this, I think, will do to say. O thou who wrenched the lion's jaws, regardless of his teeth and claws, who drowned the hydra, if I'm right, and Cerberus did drag to light, who flung the boar and tossed the bull over thy shoulders with a pull, captured the oxen, Geron slew, and Diomedes vanquished too, who caught the stag that ran so fast, and shot those birds of prey at last, who conquered those great Amazons, and all the stables cleansed at once two thousand of them, and, I'm told, procured the apples made of gold. O Hercules, so strong thou art, sure thou canst move this horse and cart. Scarce had he ceased when rolling thunder surprised this man with fear and wonder. Then straight before his eyes he sees no lesser form than Hercules, who soon began in words like these. You impious, idle, lazy fellow, how long will you lie there and bellow, disturbing my immortal neighbours with that long rigmy roll of labours? Think you I'll help you with your load while you lie sprawling on the road? Apply your shoulders to the wheel, nor idly thus before me kneel. 
then should the task too mighty prove i may assist you with a shove but those who indolent remain may roar for help but roar in vain moral this is the moral of the fable to help yourself if you are able end of the clown praying to hercules Chapter 9 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Lion and the Ass. In the days of old Aesop, it once came to pass that a lion saw fit to make friends with an ass for said he i well know by myself he can bray in such style as to strike all the beasts with dismay now you take the rear i'll proceed to the van said the lion then make the worst noise that you can they'll be seized with a panic i have not a doubt which will end in their total dispersion and rout so the ass brayed a tune which he thought would succeed when the cattle made off with incredible speed then the lion fell on them and made them his prey only think said the donkey how well i can bray well said he to the lion pray how did it do indeed said that beast sir you frightened me too and had i not known it before i protest i myself should have run with all speed like the rest moral some folks think their failings for merits will pass though none will think so i admit but an ass end of the lion and the ass Chapter Ten of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Dog Invited to Dinner. A gentleman, a friend of mine, invited sundry folks to dine. I cannot tell you who, because I was not there, but someone was who when returned with ready pen recorded that which happened then it seems this circumstance occurred the dog the orders overheard for game and fish and butcher's meat and much besides a royal treat so finding mighty preparations the dog asked one of his relations he thought it was, and so do I, a lucky opportunity. This dog arrived, was ushered in, where charming things were smelt and seen. The meat, while raw, so tempting looked, they wished it were not to be cooked. Though then they might have thought it nice, but for the pepper and the spice. Yet as it might be underdone, and some have pepper, some have none. Twixt venison, mutton, beef, and veal, they doubted not to make a meal. But woe befell the luckless cur, whence some disaster you'll infer. The cook, you see, who chanced to find him, turned round and softly crept behind him, then took a leg in either hand all which you clearly understand and bore the inverted howling beast far from the kitchen and the feast then from the window to the yard was thrown the dog who thought it hard twas bad enough to break his bones by falling headlong on the stones but this though bad was not the worst that yet remains to be rehearsed for all the dogs and cats he knew pressed round with friendly how d'ye do do said our hero somewhat gruff what do you mean i'm well enough 
we're glad to hear it sir said they how did you like your dinner pray dinner said he i only wish all you could taste that charming dish in truth so much i ate and drank i must acknowledge to be frank i was so sadly overcome i scarcely know how i left the room moral thus disappointment and confusion reward an impudent intrusion End of the dog invited to dinner Chapter 11 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Eagle and the Crow An eagle descending one day from the skies Seized a lamb in his talons and made him his prize then spreading his pinions abroad to the gale bore his prey through the air with a dignified sail that was very well done thought a crow i confess yet i can perform it still better i guess so saying she dropped on the back of a lamb but alas thought the crow what a blockhead i am for her feet were entangled so fast in the fleece that she neither could rise nor obtain her release so instead of her taking the lamb you must know the lamb with great ease ran away with the crow moral when little folks try with the great to compare they soon show their neighbours how little they are end of the eagle and the crow Chapter Twelve of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Mouse and the Weasel. Of a mouse I have read who so poorly was fed that her person quite dwindled away, until being so thin through a crack she squeezed in to some corn where she feasted all day when no more she could eat she essayed to retreat but how was she shocked to discern that her bulk had increased by the means of her feast to a size that forbade her return so she scrambled about but she could not get out said a weasel your hurry i blame this advice i would tender first starve yourself slender and then you may go as you came moral this mouse it is frankly confessed might be needy but that's no excuse for her being so greedy if less she had eaten no doubt through the crack which she entered so freely she might have got back End of the mouse and the weasel chapter thirteen of aesop in rhyme by jefferies taylor this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian the grapes are sour a monkey some charming ripe grapes once espied which how to obtain was the query for up to a trellis so high they were tied that he jumped till he made himself weary so finding at last they were out of his power said he let them have them who will i see that they're green and don't doubt that they're sour and fruit that's unripe makes me ill moral those will ne'er be believed by the world it is plain who pretend to dislike what they cannot obtain end of the grapes are sour chapter fourteen of aesop in rhyme by jefferies taylor this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Noel Badrian The Ass in the Lion's Skin 
an ass who imagined his virtues neglected and saw that his talents were little respected supposing folks judged of his worth by his skin resolved the first good one he saw to creep in soon after he found the fine coat of a lion oh this thought the ass by all means i will try on which at last he contrived to throw over his shoulders now said he with what awe shall i strike all beholders then he went to a pond to survey himself in it and when he had stayed to adjust it a minute had had the last look and felt sure it would do to his neighbours he hasted to make his debut dear now said the beast how provoking it is not a soul's to be seen such a fine day as this i wish though it would not hang over one's eyes must try to procure one that's nearer my size just after he met a stray pig in the road so he looked as terrific and fierce as he could but instead of his showing the smallest dismay the pig only grunted and kept on his way he next saw a fox and to fright him the more he tried when they met like a lion to roar ah said the reynard think not for a lion to pass while you act like a donkey and bray like an ass moral vulgar people well dressed will be sure to be known for the moment they speak their vulgarities shown end of the ass in the lion's skin chapter 15 of aesop in rhyme by jeffrey's taylor this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian the man who had travelled a man who had travelled his story unravelled and strange were the things he related till his hearers began to discredit the man for they were with his miracles sated so he racked his invention to keep their attention and at last he declared to them all that he leaped from the dome of st peter's at rome without being hurt by his fall for said he when at rhodes i conformed to their modes and in leaping became so expert that now should they toss us clean o'er the colossus i am certain i should not be hurt this all were agreed was surprising indeed provided the whole were authentic then the truth to confirm he employed every term in sheridan johnson or entick but good sir said a friend all our scruples must end if you would but just leap from that steeple but our hero thought fit at that hint to retreat from a pack of incredulous people moral when people assert an achievement expert and have only assertions to show it there is grounds to suspect that they are not correct the best proof of all is to do it end of the man who had travelled chapter 16 of aesop in rhyme by jefferies taylor this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian the dog and the wolf a wolf there was whose scanty fare had made his person lean and spare a dog there was so amply fed his sides were plump and sleek tis said the wolf once met this prosperous cur and thus began your servant sir i'm pleased to see you look so well though how it is i cannot tell i have not broke my fast to-day nor have i i'm concerned to say one bone in store or expectation and that i call a great vexation 
Indeed it is, the dog replied, I know no ill so great beside. But if you do not like to be so poorly fed, come live with me. Agreed, rejoined the wolf, I'll go. But pray what work am I to do? Oh, guard the house, and do not fail to bark at thieves and wag your tail. So off they jogged, and soon arrived at where the friendly mastiff lived. Well, said the wolf, I can't deny you have a better house than I. Not so, the other then replied, if you with me will hence abide. Oh, said the wolf, how kind you are. But what do you call that hanging there? Is it an iron chain, or what? Friend, said the dog, I quite forgot to mention that. Sometimes, you see, they hook that little chain to me. But it is only meant to keep us dogs from walking in our sleep. And should you wear it, you would find it's nothing that you need to mind. I'll take your word, the wolf replied. Its truth by me shall ne'er be tried. I'll have my liberty again, and you your collar and your chain. Moral Our neighbours sometimes seem to be a vast deal better off than we, yet seldom tis they really are, since they have troubles too to bear, which, if the truth were really known, are quite as grievous as our own. End of the dog and the wolf chapter 17 of aesop in rhyme by jeffrey's taylor this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian the herdsman a herdsman who lived at a time and a place which should you not know is but little disgrace discovered one morning on counting his stock that a sheep had been stolen that night from the flock oh i wish i had caught ye whoever ye be i'd have soon let you know i'd have soon let you see what ye had to expect said the herdsman i trow but i've thought of a scheme that will trouble you now so what did he do sir but put up a board describing the theft and proposed a reward of a lamb to the man who would give information concerning the thief and his true designation the project succeeded for quickly there came some half dozen neighbours demanding the lamb but tell me the thief said the herdsman at least come hither said they and we'll show you the beast the beast, said the rustic, who thought he should die on the spot when he found that the thief was a lion. I'll luck to my hurry, what now shall I do? I promised a lamb to detect you, tis true, but now I'd consent all my substance to pay, if I could but with safety get out of your way. Moral Silly people ask things that would ruin if sent. They demand them in haste, and at leisure repent. End of the Herdsman Chapter 18 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Chameleon Two friends, B and A, were disputing one day, on a creature they'd both of them seen. But who would suppose the debate that arose was whether twas scarlet or green? Said B, if you're right, I will own black is white, or that two with two added make eight. And so will I too, replied A, when you show that the creature is green as you state. Sir, it was, I maintain, I affirm it again, am I not to believe my own eyes? 
It was not, replied A, it was scarlet, I say, which none but a madman denies. Then said C, my good fellow, you'll find it is yellow, you surely have never been near it. That cannot be true, for I'm certain twas blue, said another who happened to hear it. Oh, said D, it's absurd, if you'll credit my word, the creature was brown as a berry. Not brown, sir, said Jack, when I saw it twas black. Then the neighbours began to be merry. Come, said E, hold your tongue, you are all of you wrong, or at least you are none of you right. Then a box he displayed where the creature was laid, when this marvellous lizard was white. Good people, said I, a chameleon's dye, he can change, any colour to suit. Now if this had been known, all must candidly own, you would not have commenced the dispute. Moral This great altercation showed small information, as such disputes constantly do. For ignorant minds, one most commonly finds, are excessively positive too. End of the Chameleon Chapter 19 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Boys and the Frogs Some boys beside a pond or lake were playing once at duck and drake, when, doubtless, to their heart's content, volleys of stones were quickly sent. But there were some there will be such, who did not seem amused so much. These were the frogs, to whom the game, in point of sport, was not the same. For scarce a stone arrived, tis said, but gave some frog a broken head, and scores, in less than half an hour, perished beneath the dreadful shower. At last, said one, young folks, I say, do fling your stones another way, though sport to you to throw them thus, remember, pray, tis death to us. Moral From hence this moral may be learned, let play be play to all concerned. End of The Boys and the Frogs Chapter 20 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Horse and the Ass. A horse and a donkey once met on the road. Dear me, said the former, you've got a great load. I'm really concerned at your case from my heart. Why then, thought the ass, don't you carry a part? At last said the donkey, Come, neighbour, I say, Won't you lend me a hand with my burden today? I'll carry the panniers, if you'll take the sack. If you'll stop, I can hitch it just onto your back. Not so, said the horse, for should that come to pass, Your owner, I'm certain, would think me an ass and sooner I'd bear any load he could pile than a name so contemptible, vulgar and vile. The ass gave a look, but she nothing replied, for she fell to the earth with her burden and died. So the man coming up when he saw the ass fall made the horse carry donkey, sack, panniers and all. Moral we had best with good will help our neighbours in trouble, nor be forced to comply when the labour is double. End of the Horse and the Ass Chapter 21 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Noel Badrian Mercury and the Sculptor We've often made the beasts and birds To speak their minds and utter words. So sure twill make but little odds To introduce the heathen gods. And if the fable's understood, I think you'll say the moral's good. But should you not approve the same, Aesop, not I, must bear the blame. Mercury, wishing much to know How he was liked by men below, Disguised himself in shape of man, As well we know such beings can, And to a sculptor's shop descended, Where statues of the gods were vended. There Jupiter and Juno stood, In bronze, in marble, and in wood. Mars and Minerva richly dressed, And Mercury amongst the rest. Then said he to the sculptor, Sir, pray what's the price of Jupiter? The sum was named without delay, And what do you ask for Juno, pray? A trifle more, the man replied, She's more esteemed than most beside. And what for that upon the shelf? Said Mercury, nodding at himself. Oh, said the man, his worth is small, I never charge for him at all. But when the other gods are bought, I always give him in for naught. Moral You ask me what I think of you, You're foolish and conceited too. No persons thus for praise will seek, But those who are both vain and weak. End of Mercury and the Sculptor Chapter 22 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Bull and the Gnat On the horn of a bullock alighted a gnat, to which it is likely you'll say, what of that? I'll tell you. This insect thought he was so great that the beast must be weary with bearing his weight. I'm afraid that my pressure disturbs you, said he. You must feel much oppressed by a person like me. But if for five minutes you'll let me remain, I'll remove to some tree which my weight can sustain. Sit still and be quiet, I pray, said the beast. Your weight does not burden my neck in the least. Indeed, I knew not of your coming, and so shall not miss you whene'er you think proper to go. Moral Tis the most insignificant persons we see who suppose themselves folks of importance to be. End of The Bull and the Gnat Chapter 23 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Cock and the Jewel. A cock there was, a sage was he, if Aesop we may trust, who wished to make a meal, you see, as other sages must. With this intent, as heretofore, when on the hunt for grain, our hero scratched the litter o'er with all his might and main. But scarce a minute had he scratched, when, to his great surprise, a gem with golden chain attached, he saw with both his eyes. Alack, quoth he, what have we here? A diamond, I protest, which lords and ladies buy so dear and hold in such request. But one good barleycorn to me has more intrinsic worth than all the pearls now in the sea or gold now in the earth. Moral The moral here in Aesop's mind was this, there's not a doubt. Things have most value, which we find we cannot do without. End of The Cock and the Jewel
Chapter Twenty Four of Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Man and the Lion. A man and a lion once had a dispute, which was reckoned the greatest, the man or the brute. The lion discoursed on his side at some length, and greatly enlarged on his courage and strength. The man, one would think, had enough to reply on his side the question, which none could deny. But like many others who make a pretense, he talked perfect nonsense and thought it was sense. So, said he, don't be prating, look yonder, I pray. At that sculpture of marble, now what will you say? The lion is vanquished, but as for the man, he is striding upon him, deny it who can. But pray, said the lion, who sculptured that stone? One of us, said the man, I must candidly own. But when we are the sculptors, the other replied, you'll then on the man see the lion astride. Moral. The man might have added, if he had been wise, but a beast cannot sculpture a stone if he tries. End of The Man and the Lion Chapter 25 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Two Frogs The day was hot, the heat was dire, Enough to make a post perspire. The ponds were empty, pumps were dry, The ducks were thirsty, so was I. Two frogs resolved, quite right I think, To take a tour in search of drink. And long they sped them on their way, and many a dangerous leap had they. But there appeared a well at length, which both approached with failing strength. But when they gave an anxious peep, alas, twas twenty fathoms deep. Well, said the youngest, let's descend. No, said the other, youthful friend, for should the water dry here too, I ask thee what we then should do. Moral Deep was the well, not quite so deep our moral lies. Look ere you leap. End of the Two Frogs Chapter 26 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Fox and the Crane I certainly think, said a fox to a crane, that face, ma'am, of yours is remarkably plain. That beak that you wear is so frightful a feature, it makes you appear a most singular creature. The crane, much offended at what she had heard, marched off at full speed without saying a word oh dear said the fox mrs crane i protest you misunderstood me twas only in jest come don't be affronted stay with me and dine you know very well tis this temper of mine to say such odd things to my intimate friends but you know that poor reynard no mischief intends so the crane thought it best not to break with the fox, but to take his remarks as an odd fellow's jokes. So she put on as pleasant a face as she could, when he asked her to dine, and replied that she would. But alas, she perceived that his jokes were not over, when Reynard removed from the victuals its cover. Twas neither game, butcher's meat, chicken, nor fish, but plain gravy soup, in a broad shallow dish now this the fox lapped with his tongue very quick while the crane could scarce dip in the point of her beak 
you make a poor dinner said he to his guest oh dear by no means said the bird i protest but the crane asked the fox on a subsequent day when nothing it seems for their dinner had they but some minced meat served up in a narrow necked jar too long and too narrow for reynard by far you make a poor dinner i fear said the bird why i think said the fox twould be very absurd to deny what you say yet i cannot complain but confess though a fox that i'm matched by a crane moral cunning folks who play tricks which good manners condemn may find their own tricks played again upon them end of the fox and the crane chapter 27 of aesop in rhyme by jefferies taylor this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian the traveller and the satyr a luckless wight in winter's snow travelling once a forest through cold and hungry tired and wet began in words like these to fret oh what a sharp inclement day and what a dismal dreary way no friendly cot no cheering fields no food this howling forest yields i've naught in store or expectation there's naught before me but starvation not quite so bad a voice replied quickly the traveller turned aside and saw the satyr of the wood who close beside his dwelling stood here is my cave hard by said he walk in you're welcome pray be free the traveller did not hesitate hoping for something good to eat but followed to his heart's content blowing his fingers as he went pray said the satyr may i know for what you blow your fingers so what need you said the man be told to warm my fingers numb with cold indeed was all his host replied intent some pottage to provide which heated well with spice infused was to his shivering guest produced so hot it was as aesop sung it made our traveller scald his tongue and wishing not again to do it our hero could not wait but blew it what said his host in accent rough is not your pottage hot enough yes said the man full well i know it tis far too hot that's why i blow it you artful villain do you so his host replied with angry brow my cave shall not a moment hold a man that blows both hot and cold by none but rogues can that be done you double dealing wretch be gone moral the traveller scarce deserved such wrath for warming fingers cooling broth no statutes old or new forbid it although with the same mouth he did it yet this beware of old and young what aesop meant a double tongue which flatters now with civil clack and slanders soon behind one's back End of The Traveller and the Satyr Chapter 28 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Travellers and the Purse Two friends once were walking in sociable chat, when a purse one espied on the ground well come said he thank my good fortune for that what a large sum of money i've found nay do not say i said his friend for you know tis but justice to share it with me i share it with you said the other how so he who found it the owner should be 
be it so, said his friend, but what sound do I hear? Stop, thief, one is calling to you. He comes with a constable close in the rear. Said the other, oh, what shall we do? Nay, do not say we, said his friend, for you know you claimed the sole right to the prize, and since all the money was taken by you, with you the dishonesty lies. Moral When people are selfish, dishonest and mean, their nature in dealing will quickly be seen. If the business in question be pleasure or profit, then each thinks of course he should have the whole of it. But if it should happen tis danger or toil, then indeed they will vote for dividing the spoil. End of The Travellers and the Purse Chapter 29 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Mouth and the Limbs In days of yore, they say, t'was then when all things spoke their mind, the arms and legs of certain men to treason felt inclined. These arms and legs together met, as snugly as they could, with knees and elbows, hands and feet, in discontented mood. Said they, "'Tis neither right nor fair, nor is there any need, to labour with such toil and care, the greedy mouth to feed. This we're resolved no more to do, though we so long have done it. Ah, said the knees and elbows too, and we are bent upon it. I, said the tongue, may surely speak, since his inmate I am, and for his vices while you seek, his virtues I'll proclaim. You say the mouth embezzles all the fruits of your exertion, but I on this assembly call to prove the base assertion. The food which you with labour gain, he too with labour choose. Nor does he long the food retain, but gives it for your use. But he his office has resigned, to whom you may prefer. He begs you therefore now to find some other treasurer. Well, be it so, they all replied, his wish shall be obeyed. We think the hands may now be tried as treasurers in his stead. The hands with joy to this agreed, and all to them was paid. But they the treasure kept indeed, and no disbursements made. Once more the clamorous members met, a lean and hungry throng, when all allowed from head to feet that what they'd done was wrong. To take his office once again, the mouth they all implored, who soon accepted it, and then health was again restored. Moral The mouth has claims of large amount from arms, legs, feet, and hands, but let them not, on that account, pay more than it demands. End of The Mouth and the Limbs Chapter 30 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Conceited Cur. I have read in a book of a mischievous dog, round whose neck there was fastened a large wooden log, for reasons I need not declare. But, not seeming to know for what purpose t'was made, he ran to his friends and acquaintance and said, See, what a smart collar I wear. 
we see it distinctly a mastiff replied but strongly advise you the honour to hide which is what we should certainly do for instead of exciting the smallest respect it strongly implies when we come to reflect that you've had a sound horsewhipping too moral i will not affirm that i ever have known any lad not ashamed his fool's cap should be shown yet many there are that with ease could be named who can show their fool's tricks without feeling ashamed End of the Conceited Cur Chapter 31 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Hare and the Tortoise Said a hare to a tortoise, good sir what a while you have been only crossing the way why i really believe that to go half a mile you must travel two nights and a day i am very contented the creature replied though i walk but a tortoise's pace but if you think proper the point to decide we will run half a mile in a race very good said the hare said the tortoise proceed and the fox shall decide who has won then the hare started off with incredible speed but the tortoise walked leisurely on come tortoise friend tortoise walk on said the hare well i shall stay here for my dinner why it will take you a month at that rate to get there then how can you hope to be winner but the tortoise could hear not a word that she said, for he was far distant behind. So the hare felt secure while at leisure she fed, and took a sound nap when she dined. So at last the slow walker came up with the hare, and there fast asleep he did spy her. And he cunningly crept with such caution and care, that she woke not although he passed by her. Well, now, thought the hare, when she opened her eyes, for the race, and I soon shall have done it. But who can describe her chagrin and surprise when she found that the tortoise had won it? Moral Thus plain plodding people we often shall find will leave hasty confident people behind. End of The Hare and the Tortoise Chapter 32 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Honest Woodman A certain man excuse i pray commencing in the dog-trot way for what i ask am i to do when aesop does not tell me who this man with many a hearty stroke was cutting down an ancient oak when as he smote his axe's head far from its handle quickly sped and to the woodman's great dismay into the river found its way now tell us why, the rustic cried, ye could not on the stick abide. You surely might have stayed with me, at least till I had felled the tree. Thus did the man his thoughts express, and sat him down in great distress. But had not long reclined himself, when there appeared a sprightly elf, who asked the reason of his grief, and promised also quick relief. The man explained, the sprite withdrew, intent his magic power to show. Forthwith he dived beneath the stream, full many a fathom to redeem his woodman's hatchet. But behold, he found one made of solid gold. Is this the tool you lost? said he. Oh no, that ne'er belonged to me, the man replied. 
Then, said the sprite, I'll try again to get the right. Once more he plunged, once more emerged, and now a silver hatchet urged on our poor rustic. But the clown, too honest, was e'en that to own. Well, said the fairy, I'll persist till I procure the one you missed. Again withdrawn, again returned, the man with joy his axe discerned. Said he, Thou art a friend in need, this is my very tool indeed. Pray take it then, the elf replied, and gave the other two beside. But ere the man found what to say, the friendly sprite had flown away. Meanwhile, the man neglected not to tell his neighbours what he'd got. Well, said a friend, if that be true, I'll go and try what I can do. Then to the place an axe he took, and soon he dropped it in the brook, then sat him down to mourn the same, when, as before, the fairy came, who, finding how the matter stood, brought a gold hatchet from the flood, then asked the man if that were his. Oh, yes, said he, indeed it is, that is the very self-same hatchet, then tried with eager haste to snatch it. But ere the gold was grasped by him, the sprite returned it to the stream. Oh, said the rustic, woe is me, I near again that axe shall see. Nor yet your own, rejoined the elf, unless you make a plunge yourself. Moral A maxim I shall now rehearse, which suits exactly with my verse, that honesty is found to be the best and wisest policy, although the crafty man disdains the honest man as wanting brains. End of The Honest Woodman Chapter 33 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Crow and the Pitcher You must know that a crow felt inclined when she dined for some drink, being thirsty and hot. But puddle or pool her fever to cool, within twenty miles there was not. Then said she, Woe is me, surely I must soon die. When, lo, she espied at a distance a pitcher or jug, alias pipkin or mug, which promised the needed assistance. Apropos, said the crow, now I think I shall drink, and I shall be there in a minute. But alas for the bird, still her draught was deferred, for scarcely a cupful was in it. How provoking, I'm choking, said she, but let's see, sure I've thought of a project to gain it. With stones from my bill the deep jug I will fill, then the water will rise till my thirst it supplies. She did so, and so did obtain it. Moral Had this two-legged thing been as stupid as many, though dying for drink she would not have got any. For the good that in life one most commonly gains Arrives not by luck, but by using one's brains. End of The Crow and the Picture Chapter 34 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Young Mouse In a crack near a cupboard, with dainties provided, a certain young mouse with her mother resided. So securely they lived on that fortunate spot, any mouse in the land might have envied their lot. But one day this young mouse, who was given to roam, having made an excursion some way from her home, on a sudden returned with such joy in her eyes that her grey sedate parent expressed some surprise. 
Oh, mother, said she, the good folks of this house, I'm convinced have not any ill will to a mouse. And those tales can't be true, which you always are telling, for they've been at the pains to construct us a dwelling. The floor is of wood, and the walls are of wires, exactly the size that one's comfort requires. And I'm sure that we there should have nothing to fear, if ten cats with their kittens at once should appear. And then they have made such nice holes in the wall, one could slip in and out with no trouble at all. But forcing one through such rough crannies as these always gives one's poor ribs a most terrible squeeze. But the best of all is they've provided us well with a large piece of cheese of most exquisite smell. Twas so nice I had put my head in to go through when I thought it my duty to come and fetch you. Ah, child, said her mother, believe I entreat both the cage and the cheese are a horrible cheat. Do not think all that trouble they took for our good. They would catch us and kill us all there if they could, as they've caught and killed scores, and I never could learn that a mouse who once entered did ever return. Moral. Let the young people mind what the old people say and when danger is near them, keep out of the way. End of The Young Mouse Chapter 35 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Toad and the Fly when Cadmus lived in days of yore, three thousand years ago or more, retired within the shady grot, there lived a toad, deny it not, who, thoughtful, sleepy, or sedate, passed years away in lonely state. At last he slept, as it should seem, beside a petrifying stream, which ere he woke to find it out, with stone enclosed him round about so tightly fitted to his shape he could not stretch nor even gape oh had he known ere his repose how many years he had to doze no doubt he would have settled all his worldly matters great and small nor left his children fighting battles about his sundry goods and chattels who knew not pardon this digression whether they ought to take possession three thousand years had he to pass embedded in the solid mass i hope this message of stone was rent free all this time i own however not a year ago it seems this block was sawn in two when to the workmen's great surprise the drowsy reptile met their eyes who issued from his durance freed a venerable toad indeed. Then crowds drew near from far to see this remnant of antiquity, who fully conscious of the fact their utmost homage did exact. It happened then there came that way a fly that only lives a day, who thinking it was rather odd such reverence should be paid a toad, first asked the reason of the fuss and then addressed the reptile thus and so said he i find it's true this world's but twice as old as you a poor ephemeron am i this day was born this day must die yet i maintain say what you will my life has been the longest still what said the toad with angry hiss do you mean by such a speech as this sir said the fly with ready breath sleep is another kind of death your days though more than i can number you've spent in one continued slumber my life though short it is i own has never once a slumber known i do not reckon in the term while i remained a torpid worm 
nor you the time you must have dozed ere stone around you could have closed nor when one's half asleep you see which you at present seem to be but when one's broad awake you know and doing what one has to do as has this very day been done by me a poor ephemeron which single day it hence appears exceeds your long three thousand years moral i'd further add the sense to fix lie not till nine but rise at six the longer you can keep awake the longer you your life will make end of the toad and the fly Chapter thirty six of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Milkmaid. A milkmaid who poised a full pail on her head, thus mused on her prospects in life, it is said. Let's see, I should think that this milk will procure one hundred good eggs or four score to be sure well then stop a bit it must not be forgotten some of these may be broken and some may be rotten but if twenty for accidents should be detached it will leave me just sixty sound eggs to be hatched well sixty sound eggs no sound chickens i mean of these some may die we'll suppose seventeen seventeen not so many say ten at the most which will leave fifty chickens to boil or to roast but then there's their barley how much will they need why they take but one grain at a time when they feed so that's a mere trifle now then let us see at a fair market price how much money there'll be six shillings a pair five four three and six to prevent all mistakes that low price i will fix now what will that make fifty chickens i said fifty times three and sixpence i'll ask brother ned oh but stop three and sixpence a pair i must sell them well a pair is a couple now then let us tell em a couple in fifty will go my poor brain why just a score times and five pair will remain twenty-five pair of fowls now how plaguesome it is that i can't reckon up such money as this well there's no use in trying so let's give a guess i will say twenty pounds and it can't be no less twenty pounds i am certain will buy me a cow thirty geese and two turkeys eight pigs and a sow now if these turn out well at the end of the year i shall fill both my pockets with guineas tis clear then i'll bid that old tumble-down hovel good-bye my mother she'll scold and my sisters they'll cry but i won't care a crow's egg for all they can say i shan't go to stop with such beggars as they but forgetting her burden when this she had said the maid superciliously tossed up her head when alas for her prospects her milk pail descended and so all her schemes for the future were ended moral this moral i think may be safely attached reckon not on your chickens before they are hatched end of the milkmaid chapter thirty seven of Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Lark and Her Young Ones. 
a lark who had her nest concealed says aesop in a barley field began as harvest time drew near the reaping of the corn to fear afraid they would her nest descry before her tender brood could fly she charged them therefore every day before for food she flew away to watch the farmer in her stead and listen well to all he said it chanced one day she scarce was gone ere came the farmer and his son the farmer well his field surveyed and sundry observations made at last i'll tell you what said he this corn is fit to cut i see but we our neighbours help must borrow so tell them we begin to-morrow just after this the lark returned when from her brood this news she learnt ah dearest mother then said they pray let us all be gone to-day my dears said she you need not fret i shall not be uneasy yet for if he waits for neighbours aid the business long will be delayed at dawn she left her nest once more and charged her young ones as before at five the farmer came again and waited for his friends in vain well said the man i fancy son these friends we can't depend upon to-morrow early mind you go and let our own relations know again the lark approached her nest when round her all her young ones pressed and told their mother word for word the fresh intelligence they'd heard ah children be at ease said she we're safe another day i see for these relations you will find just like his friends will stay behind at dawn again the lark withdrew and did again her charge renew once more the farmer early came and found the case was just the same the day advanced the sun was high but not a single help drew nigh then said the farmer hark ye son i see this job will not be done while thus we wait for friends and neighbours so you and i'll commence our labours to-morrow early we'll begin ourselves and get our harvest in now said the lark when this she heard our movement must not be deferred for if the farmer and his son themselves begin twill soon be done the morrow proved the lark was right for all was cut and housed by night moral hence while we wait for others aid our business needs must be delayed which might be done with half the labour twould take to go and call a neighbour end of the lark and her young ones chapter thirty eight of aesop in rhyme by jefferies taylor this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Philosopher and the Acorn. A philosopher, proud of his wit and his reason, sat him under an oak in a hot summer season. On the oak grew an acorn or two, it is said. On the ground grew a pumpkin as big as his head. Thought the sage, what's the reason this oak is so strong a few acorns to bear that are scarce an inch long while this poor feeble plant has a weight to sustain which had much better hang on the tree it is plain but just at the time the philosopher spoke an acorn dropped down on his head from the oak then said he who just now thought his plan was so clever i'm glad that this was not a pumpkin however moral the sage would no doubt have looked grievously dull had a pumpkin descended with force on his skull of his folly then let us in future beware and believe that such matters are best as they are leave the manners and customs of oak trees alone of acorns and pumpkins 
and look to our own. End of the Philosopher and the Acorn Chapter 39 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Two Cats Two cats or dogs, just which you please, purloined a piece of Cheshire cheese. But when to part the same they tried, they did not seem quite satisfied but after some small altercation referred the same to arbitration, entrusting to a monkey's paws the whole disposal of their cause. Now then, said he with learned look, as in his hands the scales he took, you say these bits should weigh the same, but one I see will kick the beam, unless I have a bit of t'other. Dear me! Now this outweighs the other. What shall I do? Another bite yet I must have to get them right. Hey day, they are unequal yet. Well, I'll adjust them, do not fret, said he, and bit another piece from the small remnant of their cheese. Hold, said the cats, good sir, refrain, and give us back our cheese again. Not so, the learned judge replied, justice is not yet satisfied. A case of consequence like this I cannot in such haste dismiss. Another piece from this must come to gain an equilibrium. Thus he the business did delay till scarce an ounce was left to weigh. Once more the cats with hunger pressed entreated him to spare the rest. Friends, said the ape, this piece of cheese will barely pay the lawyer's fees, who straight devoured that morsel too, dismissed the court, and then withdrew. Moral. From this I hope you'll plainly see how much they lose who disagree. You'd better take a portion small than go to law and lose it all. End of the Two Cats Chapter 40 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Wolf and the Crane A wolf, once forgetting the size of his swallow, tried to pass a large marrow-bone through it. Oh dear, said the beast, thinking death was to follow, how careless and stupid to do it. His mouth was propped open by means of the bone, and his breathing was greatly impeded. But a crane coming up, he contrived to make known what kind of assistance he needed. How do you do, said the bird, said the beast, very ill, for a bone has got down the wrong way. But if you can extract it by means of your bill, the service I'll amply repay. Thought the crane, I'm no surgeon, yet all must agree that my beak will make excellent forceps. And as for the money, I do not now see why I need refuse taking his worships. Said the bird, it's agreed. Said his patient, proceed and take the bone hence, I beseech, which after a while, and with infinite toil, the crane at last managed to reach. Thank my stars, said the beast, from his terrors released. Thank you too, sir, said he to the bird. Alas, said the crane, is this all I'm to gain? I was waiting the promised reward. Said the wolf, you forget, I've contracted no debt since the service was rendered by me. Your head I released from the jaws of a beast, and now you're demanding a fee? Moral. Give your help to a wolf, should he beg for your aid, but you must not expect when you've done to be paid. End of The Wolf and the Crane
Chapter Forty One of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Fox and the Goat. A fox, by chance and not design, into a well did tumble. So it fell out that he fell in, which made poor Rainyard grumble. A goat that wished to quench his thirst approached the well with haste, but seeing the fox had got there first, asked how he liked the taste. How, said the fox, these waters are delicious, I assure ye. So wholesome too, that if you were now dying, they would cure ye. Deceived by this vile fellow's clack, the silly goat descended. So Rainyard, jumping on his back, got out as he intended. Moral. When we take the advice of a rogue, who can tell, but twill end like the goat jumping into the well. End of The Fox and the Goat Chapter 42 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Lame Man and the Blind Two persons once met in a dangerous place, when each to the other thus opened his case. Said one, O oh, good Christian, do pray be so kind as to lend me your aid, for you see I am blind. Said the other, Good Christian, tis well that you came, do help me, I pray, for I'm dreadfully lame. Alas, said the blind, what is now to be done? I can run, but can't see, you can see, but can't run. But at last added he, tell you what, honest friend, I will borrow your eyes, but my legs I will lend. So the cripple consented and got on his back and thus both with safety continued their track. Moral By this fable you'll see we've endeavoured to show what a little good-natured contrivance can do. Chapter 43 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Fox and the Hen A hungry fox, in quest of prey, into an outhouse found his way. When looking round with skilful search, he spied a hen upon a perch. Thought Reynard, what's the reason why they place her on a roost so high? I know not what the use can be, unless it's out of spite to me. As thus he thought, the hen awoke, when thus to her sly Reynard spoke. Dear madam, I'm concerned to hear you've been unwell for half a year. I could not quell my strong desire after your welfare to inquire. But pray come down and take the air, you ne'er get well while sitting there. I'm sure it will not hurt your cough. Do give me leave to help you off. I thank you, sir, the hen replied, I'd rather on my roost abide. Tis true enough I've been unwell, and am so now, the truth to tell, and am so nervous, you must know, I dare not trust myself below, and therefore say to those who call, I see no company at all, for from my perch should I descend, I'm certain in my death twould end. As then I know without presumption my cough would end in a consumption. Moral Thus cunning people often find their crafty overtures declined by prudent people whom they thought, for want of wit, would soon be caught. End of The Fox and the Hen Chapter 44 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Noel Badrian The Tortoise Once a tortoise complained, though twas not of much use, that he scarce could see over the back of a goose, that his legs were so short and his pace was so slow, of the world and its wonders he nothing could know. So at last he determined to alter his lot, or at least for a season to rise from that spot. So he mentioned his thoughts to a bird that he knew, who agreed to oblige him and give him a view. So this bird and another supported a stick, which was not very heavy or clumsy or thick. This the tortoise enclosed in his mouth very tight, while the bird soon ascended a wonderful height. But an eagle who chanced the strange creature to see, exclaimed with amazement, Pray who can that be? Oh, the king of the tortoises, do you not know him? said they, tis our honour his kingdom to show him. Said the bird, ere I take that as true, I must pause. The tortoise, impatient, then opened his jaws to confirm his new title, when straight he descended, so his journey and reign and existence were ended. Moral So far had the tortoise to fall, they relate, that he'd time while descending to muse on his fate. Ah, thought he, thus I pay for my foolish ambition, which would not be content with a humble condition. Yet I might have hung safely, I cannot deny, had my mouth not been opened to utter a lie. End of the Tortoise Chapter 45 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Dog of Reflection. A dog growing thinner for want of a dinner once purloined him a joint from a tray. How happy I am with this shoulder of lamb, thought the cur as he trotted away. But the way that he took lay just over a brook, which he found it was needful to cross. So without more ado he plunged in to go through, not dreaming of danger or loss. But what should appear in this rivulet clear, as he thought upon coolest reflection? But a cur like himself, who with ill-gotten pelf had run off in that very direction. Thought the dog, apropos! But that instant let go, as he snatched at this same water spaniel, the peace he possessed. So, with hunger distressed, he slowly walked home to his kennel. Moral. Hence, when we are needy, don't let us be greedy. Excuse me this line of digression. Lest in snatching at all, like the dog, we let fall the good that we have in possession. End of the Dog of Reflection Chapter 46 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Travellers and Bear Two travellers one morning set out from their home. It might be from Sparta, from Athens or Rome it matters not which, but agreed, it is said, should danger arise to lend each other aid. But scarce was this done, when forth rushing amain sprung a bear from a wood towards these travellers twain. Then one of our heroes, with courage immense, climbed into a tree, and there found his defence. The other fell flat to the earth with his dread, when the bear came and smelt him, and thought he was dead. So not liking the carcass, away trotted he, when straight our brave hero descended the tree. Then said he, I can't think what the bear could propose, when so close to his ear he presented his nose. Why this, said the other, he told me to do, to beware for the future of cowards like you. Moral 
those people who run from their friends in distress will be left when themselves are in trouble, I guess. End of The Travellers and Bear Chapter 47 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Frogs and the Bull A bull, once treading near a bog, displaced the entrails of a frog who near his foot did trust them. In fact, so great was the contusion, and made of his inwards such confusion, no art could readjust them. It chanced that some who saw his fate did to a friend the deed relate. With croakings, groans, and hisses, the beast, they said, in size excelled all other beasts. Their neighbour swelled and asked, as large as this is? O oh, larger far than that, said they, do not attempt it, madam, pray. But still the frog distended, and said, I'll burst, but I'll exceed. She tried, and burst herself indeed, and so the matter ended. Moral Should you with pride inflate and swell, as did the frog, then who can tell? Your sides may crack as has been shown, and we with laughing crack our own. End of The Frogs and the Bull Chapter 48 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian the Council of Mice Some mice, who saw fit once a quarter to meet, to arrange the concerns of their city, thought it needful to choose, as is common with us, first a chairman and then a committee. When the chairman was seated, the object he stated, for which at that meeting they sat, which was, it would seem, the concerting a scheme to defeat the designs of a cat. Dr. Nibblecheese rose and said, I would propose to this cat that we fasten a bell. He who likes what I've said now will hold up his head. He who does not may hold up his tail. So out of respect they their noses erect, except one who the order reversed. Eyes all then but one, but yet naught could be done until he had his reasons rehearsed. I shall not, said this mouse, waste the time of this house in long arguments, since, as I view it, the scheme would succeed without doubt, if indeed we could find any mouse who would do it. Here, here was the cry, and no bells we will try unless you will fasten them on. So, quite broken-hearted, the members departed, for the bill was rejected nem con. Moral. Then be not too hasty in giving advice, lest your schemes should remind of the council of mice. You had better delay your opinion a year, than put forth a ridiculous one, it is clear. End of the Council of Mice Chapter 49 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Wolf and the Lamb. A wolf and lamb once chanced to meet beside a stream whose waters sweet brought various kinds of beasts together when dry and sultry was the weather. Now though the wolf came there to drink, of eating he began to think as soon as near the lamb he came and straight resolved to kill the same yet thought it better to begin with threatening words and angry mien and so said he to him below how dare you stir the waters so 
making the cool refreshing flood as brown as beer and thick as mud sir said the lamb that cannot be the water flows from you to me so tis impossible i think that what i do can spoil your drink i say it does you saucy puss how dare you contradict me thus but more than this you idle clack you railed at me behind my back two years ago i have been told how so i'm not a twelve month old the lamb replied so i suspect your honour is not quite correct if not your mother it must be and that is all the same to me rejoined the wolf who waited not but killed and ate him on the spot moral some like the wolf adopt the plan to make a quarrel if they can but none with you can hold dispute if you're determined to be mute for sure this proverb must be true that every quarrel must have two End of the Wolf and the Lamb Chapter 50 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Beasts in Partnership this firm once existed, I'll have you to know, Mrs. Lion, Wolf, Tiger, Fox, Leopard, and Co. These in business were joined, and of course twas implied they their stocks should unite, and the profits divide. Now the fable relates, it so happened one day, that their efforts combined made a bullock their prey. But agreed that the lion should make the division, and patiently waited the monarch's decision. My friends, said the lion, I've parted, you see, the whole into six, which is right you'll agree. One part I may claim, as my share in the trade. Oh, take it and welcome, they all of them said. I claim too the second, since no one denies, twas my courage and conduct that gained you the prize and as for the third that you know is a fine to the lord of the manor and therefore is mine hey day said the fox stop a bit said the lion i have not quite done said he fixing his eye on the other three parts you are fully aware that as tribute one other part comes to my share and i think twould be prudent the next to put by somewhere safe in my den for a future supply and the other you know will but barely suffice to pay those expenses which always arise if this be the case said the fox i discern that the business to us is a losing concern if so to withdraw i think would be best oh yes let us break up the firm said the rest and so, for you may not have heard of it yet, it was quickly dissolved, though not in the Gazette. Moral Some folks in their dealings, like him in the fable, will take others' shares if they think they are able. But let them not wonder who act in this way, if they find none will join them in business or play. End of The Beasts in Partnership Chapter fifty one of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Lion and the Mouse. A lion, with the heat oppressed, one day composed himself to rest. But whilst he dozed, as he intended, a mouse his royal back ascended nor thought of harm as aesop tells mistaking him for something else and travelled o'er him and round him and might have left him as he found him had he not tremble when you hear tried to explore the monarch's ear 
who straightway woke with wrath immense and shook his head to cast him hence you rascal what are you about said he when he had turned him out i'll teach you soon the lion said to make a mouse hole in my head so saying he prepared his foot to crush the trembling tiny brute but he the mouse with tearful eye implored the lion's clemency who thought it best at last to give his little prisoner a reprieve twas nearly twelve months after this the lions chanced his way to miss when pressing forward heedless yet he got entangled in a net with dreadful rage he stamped and tore and straight commenced a lordly roar when the poor mouse who heard the noise attended for she knew his voice then what the lion's utmost strength could not effect she did at length with patient labour she applied her teeth the network to divide and so at last forth issued he a lion by a mouse set free moral few are so small or weak i guess but may assist us in distress nor shall we ever if we're wise the meanest or the least despise End of the Lion and the Mouse Chapter 52 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Jealous Ass There lived, says friend Aesop, some ages ago, an ass who had feelings acute you must know this ass to be jealous felt strongly inclined and for reasons which follow felt hurt in his mind it seemed that his master as i understand had a favourite dog which he fed from his hand nay the dog was permitted to jump on his knee an honour that vexed our poor donkey to see now thought he what's the reason i cannot see any that i have no favours while he has so many if all this is got by just wagging his tail why i have got one which i'll wag without fail so the donkey resolved to try what he could do and determined unusual attentions to show when his master was dining came into the room good sir said his friends why your donkey is come indeed said their host great astonishment showing when he saw the ass come while his tail was a-going but who can describe his dismay or his fear when the donkey reared up and brayed loud in his ear you rascal get down john edward or dick where are you make haste and come here with a stick the man roared his guests laughed the dog barked the bell rung coals poker and tongs at the donkey were flung till the blows and the kicks with combined demonstration convinced him that this was a bad speculation so mortified deeply his footsteps retrod he hurt much in his mind but still more in his body moral so some silly children as stupid as may be will cry for indulgences fit for a baby had they entered the room while the donkey withdrew they'd have seen their own folly and punishment too let them think of this fable and what came to pass nor forget he who played this fine game was an ass. End of the Jealous Ass Chapter 53 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Town and Country Mice a plain 
but honest country mouse residing in a miller's house once on a time invited down an old acquaintance of the town and soon he brought his dainties out the best he had there's not a doubt a dish of oatmeal and grey peas with half a candle and some cheese some beans and if i'm not mistaken a charming piece of yorkshire bacon and then to show he was expert in such affairs a fine dessert was next produced all which he pressed with rustic freedom on his guest but he the city epicure this homely fare could not endure indeed he scarcely broke his fast by what he took but said at last old crony now i'll tell you what i don't admire this lonely spot this dreadful dismal dirty hole seems more adapted for a mole than tis for you oh could you see my residence how charmed you'd be instead of bringing up your brood in wind and wet and solitude come bring them all at once to town we'll make a courtier of a clown i think that for your children's sake tis proper my advice to take well said his host i can but try and so poor quiet hole good-bye then off they jogged for many a mile talking of splendid things the while at last in town they all arrived found where the city mouse had lived entered at midnight through a crack and rested from their tedious track now said the city mouse i'll show what kind of fare i've brought you to on which he led the rustic mice into a larder snug and nice where everything a mouse could relish did every shelf and nook embellish now is this not to be preferred to your grey peas upon my word it is the country mouse replied all this must needs the point decide scarce had they spoken these words when lo a tribe of servants hastened through and also two gigantic cats who spied our country mouse and brats then by a timely exit she just saved herself and family oh ask me not said she in haste your tempting dainties more to taste i much prefer my homely peas to splendid dangers such as these moral then let not those begin to grumble whose lot is safe though poor and humble nor envy him who better fares but for each good has twenty cares End of the Town and Country Mice Chapter 54 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Cat and the Fox a cat and a fox held a long consultation concerning the times and the state of the nation when the aspect of things led them both to infer that a grand revolution must shortly occur said the fox for my country it is that i fear for as to myself i can always get clear i have not at present much reason to fret for i've got a thousand new schemes for them yet indeed said the cat as for me i've but one and if that should fail i'm for ever undone the only protection remaining for me when the enemy comes i must find in a tree a very poor prospect said reynard i trow but see said the cat they're approaching us now then each to his mode of escaping betook the fox to his schemes and the cat to an oak who found in the tree she could safely remain while the fox with his thousand manoeuvres was slain moral hence it needs must appear that when danger is near cunning folks are not cunning enough 
and that persons who boast of their cleverness most fare the worst when it's put to the proof. End of The Cat and the Fox Chapter 55 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian The Wasp and the Snail You ugly brown creature, get out of my way, said a wasp to a snail on a fine summer's day. But how can you move, poor contemptible thing, with that load? and with neither a leg nor a wing. Oh, dear, if I had such a burden as you, I cannot imagine what thing I could do. I think, though, I e'en should go out of my mind if I to that clumsy great shell were confined. But the snail, so resigned and contented was he, still pursued his dull course up the stem of the tree. These remarks on his person could give him no pain, seeing he of his blandishments never was vain. Though it took him all day a small distance to climb, yet his business was always transacted in time. And as for his shell, it will quickly be seen how glad of its shelter the wasp would have been. For the wasp, somewhat vexed that he could not prevail, and extort a reply from this peaceable snail, resolving to do something now he must heed, determined to try how his sting would succeed. But alas, for the wasp, while with petulance fierce the snail's shell he vainly endeavoured to pierce, a slight blow was given by one so expert that the insect was crushed while the snail was unhurt. Moral This moral, I think, may be safely applied, and perhaps it occurred to the wasp ere he died, those who proudly insult their poor neighbours will find that a punishment follows them closely behind. End of The Wasp and the Snail Chapter 56 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. The Fox and the Crow. Crows feed upon worms, yet an author affirms Cheshire cheese they will get if they're able. For, said he, I well know one unprincipled crow once purloined a large piece from my table. Then away darted she to the shade of a tree to deposit the booty within her. But it never occurred to the mind of the bird that a fox was to have it for dinner. How many a slip twixt the cup and the lip! Excuse me, I pray the digression said a fox to himself, I can share in the pelf if I act with my usual discretion. So said he, Is't you? Pray, ma'am, how do you do? I have long wished to pay you a visit. For a twelvemonth has passed since I heard of you last, which is not very neighbourly, is it? But, dear madam, said he, you are dining, I see. On that subject I ask your advice. Pray, ma'am, now can you tell where provisions they sell that are not an extravagant price? Bread and meat are so dear, and have been for a year, that poor people can scarcely endure it. And then cheese is so high that such beggars as I, till it falls, cannot hope to procure it. But the ill-behaved bird did not utter a word, still intent on retaining her plunder. Thought the fox, it should seem this is not a good scheme. What else can I think of, I wonder? So said Reynard once more, I ne'er knew it before, but your feathers are whiter than snow is. But thought he, when he'd said it, she'll never give it credit, for what bird is so black as a crow is? But I'm told that your voice is a horrible noise, which they say of all sounds is the oddest, 
but then this is absurd for it never is heard since you are so excessively modest if that's all thought the crow i will soon let you know that all doubt on that score may be ended then most laughably piped this poor silly biped when quickly her dinner descended moral if this biped had not been so vain and conceited she would not by the fox quite so soon have been cheated but perhaps the term biped to some may be new tis a two-legged creature perchance it is you End of the Fox and the Crow Chapter 57 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian Dr. Wolf a wolf grown too old for the chase it should seem to accomplish his ends tried the following scheme he gave out that he was an able physician had studied diseases as well as nutrition could amputate either at shoulder or knee and only demanded the limb as his fee but that he remarked was but seldom required as bleeding would have the effect he desired so from five in the morning each day until ten was the time that he fixed to be seen at his den then many who thought themselves rather unwell repaired to the doctor their symptoms to tell and thus far is certain that none of them all had the smallest return of disorder at all said a fox there's one thing that looks odd to be sure it is dr wolf's practice to kill or to cure but i should be glad to be told i must own before i apply which of those he has done thank you friend said a horse for your prudent remark i'm afraid that till now we have been in the dark but i'll sift his intentions and if they are ill i will give him a tooth of his own for a pill so saying the horse trotted off at full speed to request the advice he pretended to need who had scarcely arrived when the bones in the place soon convinced him the fox had judged right in this case so without more ado he went up to the brute and just begged him to look at a thorn in his foot then while the wolf looked at his hoof you must know the horse kicked all his teeth down his throat at a blow and then calling aloud to his friends for assistance the poor toothless beast who could make no resistance was directly dispatched without trial or jury to the infinite joy of the beasts i assure ye moral i do not profess to commend the old horse for the steps that he took in this business of course yet this i may say and be perfectly fair from the fate of the wolf let impostors beware end of dr wolf chapter fifty eight of aesop in rhyme by jefferies taylor this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian the council of war some wars are called civil though all are agreed that to fight one is very uncivil indeed nor can it as much better manners be viewed to blow out one's brains which is certainly rude but to dwell on that topic is not my design seeing that i admit is no business of mine twill suffice for my purpose if i should be able to furnish you thence with an innocent fable it was during those wars whether civil or not when neighbours and brothers both quarrelled and fought that a town long besieged by the enemy's forces and having no walls and but slender resources at length called a council of war to propose certain means of defence from the guns of their foes 
first a mason stood up and observed twas well known that no substance resisted the bullets like stone but that plan was rejected forthwith on the ground that no money or time for it then could be found a carpenter next for a few minutes spoke and he thought twould be best to defend it with oak not with oak said a blacksmith with iron you mean i could forge such a bulwark as never was seen do but give me the order i shall not be long i'll away to my anvil and hammer ding dong hold your tongue you're a madman said one of the mob said another he wants to get hold of a job then a builder was sure lath and plaster would do said a surgeon oh i'll spread the plaster for you but then as to laths i should question their use oh sir said the builder you talk like a goose order order my friend said the chairman i pray i must beg for the future you'll mind what you say then a shoemaker said though their projects were many that he had got one that was better than any hang your walls with new boots from the top to the bottom not a bullet can pierce them the wet will not rot em this a tanner approved but he added besides that he thought twould be far better done with whole hides next there stood up a man who all thought was a fool for he said that they best clothe their buildings with wool what with wool said the rest yes with wool said the man oh dear said they what a ridiculous plan said the other i see that i shall not be heeded yet i know of an instance in which it succeeded but at last from an attic o'erlooking the place an odd voice was perceived and soon after a face here's an author said some you may know by his looks ah said he you are right make a wall of my books then said one of the crowd who apparently knew them you cannot do better for none can get through them then the author withdrew from the insults of men meekly shut up his window and took up his pen thus scheme after scheme was proposed by them all for defending their houses and building a wall and this it appears was at last the end of it while each was consulting his personal profit and disputing and proving his neighbours in fault the enemy carried the place by assault so that ruin complete and destruction befell it and not any escaped but the author to tell it moral we may learn if we please from a fable like this how absurd and contemptible selfishness is for you see twas this sordid and selfish committee which ruined completely themselves and their city end of the council of war Chapter fifty nine of Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Original Fables The Old Woman and the Death Watch. There was an old woman, I cannot tell who, but if you're a young one, it could not be you who sitting quite still and not speaking a word was greatly disturbed by a ticking she heard oh alack a death watch said the dame i declare i wish you'd have done said she jogging her chair i had rather hear five hundred pigs in a breath than that frightful ticking that augurs my death said the insect old dame that must be a mistake you know not at all why this ticking i make if i choose to keep knocking my head as i do i'm certain of this that it's nothing to you but there is a sound which you constantly hear that old folks and young have more reason to fear that clock as it ticks nibbles minutes away 
the stuff life is made of, as I have heard say. Cunning men, their machines and their engines among, never yet made a mill to grind old people young. But there, if you look, you'll not fail to behold a mill that for certain grinds young people old. And more than all this, that machine, it is said, grinds old people older until they are dead. End of the old woman and the death watch chapter sixty of aesop in rhyme by jeffreys taylor this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian original fables the donkey's dialogue twas in a shady cool retreat Two friendly donkeys chanced to meet, who, resting from a tedious walk, laid down and soon began to talk. Well met, said one, good morning, brother. Aha, good morning, said the other. A cloudy day, shall we have thunder? Sir, said his friend, I should not wonder. The cattle seem for shelter going. The sheep are bleating, cows are lowing, the frogs are croaking, geese are wheezing, pigs are grunting, cats are sneezing, and as for me, I'm well aware there must be something in the air, for I've got such a cold today, and I'm so hoarse I can scarcely bray. Well, said the other, who'd have thought it? Surely this southwest wind has brought it for i've a cold but i suppose mine must have settled in my nose for i've entirely lost my smell although i bray exceeding well ah said his friend beyond dispute a donkey's nerves are more acute than those of men who near foresee a thunderstorm so soon as we and don't you think, although we're asses, our sense and reason theirs surpasses? Why, don't you know, his friend replied, our reason is by them denied. When told of brute sagacity, they have the strange audacity to say tis instinct and maintain we've nothing else to guide our brain yet brutes do nothing half so silly as i've seen done by master billy i've known him go and tie the grass across the way where people pass or push his playmates in the dirt not caring much if they were hurt this the sole object of his labours to please himself and plague his neighbours Twas not ten days ago, I think, as I was stooping down to drink, his sense and reason to discover he needs must turn the water over. Now was this wise, or was it not? Pray, was it reason, sense, or what? If it was reason, there's no doubt, tis better far to be without. And if it twas instinct, then I say, we have a better sort than they. But I'm convinced these actions show that they have neither of the two. End of the Donkey's Dialogue Chapter 61 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Original Fables The Pride of the Cobbler's Dog. A dog of a cobbler, uh, forgive me, I pray, which belonged to a cobbler, I rather should say. This dog, like a great many others beside, whose stations are humble, was troubled with pride thought he i can see no good reason at all why i should turn out to give others the wall the next time i meet them whoever they be i'll make them remove and give passage to me 
So saying, he trotted full speed up the road, and soon met a horse and a cart with a load. Now it happened the way was so narrow just there, there was room for the cart, but not any to spare. But the mastiff, so great was the pride of his heart, pressed onward with haste, twixt the wall and the cart, when alas for our hero, his brains and his neck and his ribs and his bowels went quickly to wreck. Moral. This confession was wrung from the dog ere he died. Now, indeed, I repent my ridiculous pride. Chapter 62 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Original Fables Peter the Great A certain man, as some do say, who lived in peace and quiet, did line his inside every day with most nutritious diet. For sure, thought he, as skilfully the mutton he did carve, would be exceeding wrong in me, my body for to starve. His body, measured round about, when his great coat was on, was four good yards, there's not a doubt. His weight was forty stone. Peter the Great, I do aver, he was without pretense, judging from his diameter and his circumference. No wonder, then, this Briton bold to stir him should be loath. His arms reluctant he would fold, his legs unwilling both. And yet his loving wife would say, Peter, thou art to blame. Thou didst not stir out yesterday. Today tis all the same. Ah, Judith, dear, I doubt, said he, my stirring days are past. For don't ye know, and don't ye see, my shadow lengthens fast. Not so, quoth Judith, if I'm right, thou surely must be wrong. Thy shadow seems unto my sight as broad as it is long. Thus pleasantly, to make him glad, she answered him all way, Till he at last with sorrow sad unto his wife did say, Judith, I am not well at all, within I'm sore distressed. I fear I'm ill with what they call a load upon my chest. I know not when I've felt so bad. I think, say what you will, that goose that yesterday I had is in my stomach still. Haste for the doctor ere he's out, for he may be of use. Tell him my feet have got the gout, my stomach's got the goose. The dame approved her husband's thought, as heretofore she did, for long ago she had been taught to do as she was bid. Said she, I go, but it may be some time I shall be gone, so twill be better first for me to put the boiler on, for if by reason of your pain to fast be good for you, it does not follow hence tis plain that I must famish too. The dame then sped her on her way, and jogged for many a mile, and Peter he at home did stay, to mind the pot the while. But in his chair of ample size, while seated, I suppose, this trusty watch did shut his eyes, and straight began to doze. At last the water, heated hot, lifted the cauldron's cover, and then, as cooks affirm, the pot did boil with fury over. Water and fire with angry strife a hissing dire did make, which Peter hearing dreamt his wife was broiling him a steak. But as the hissing still kept on, he dreamed she'll surely spoil it, then gruffly growled, the meat is done, how long do you mean to broil it? Then in his dream his sleepy poll with anger great did nod he, when, lo, the tumult of his soul awoke his peaceful body. Then loudly to his wife he called, Come hither, dame, I pray, but vainly to the dame he bawled, for she was far away. 
at last he reached his walking stick to shove the boiling pot when o'er his legs it tumbled quick and water scalding hot up went his feet into the air down went his body great crack went the ancient elbow chair and eke poor peter's pate no longer now he felt the gout but roaring out amain briskly he turned his legs about and stood upright again with scalded feet and broken head he danced along the floor he had not done the like tis said for twenty years or more then round the room the woeful wight did cast a mournful eye thought he i'm in a dismal plight that none can well deny there prostrate lay the broken chair the boiler on the ground the cat she thought her fate severe to be both scald and drowned but now his wife's return from town full sore began to dread he thought he she'll surely crack my crown were it not cracked already but long he waited all forlorn with pining discontent and still his wife did not return although the day was spent at last the street door lock within the key began to rattle thought peter now will soon begin a most tremendous battle then with the doctor close behind entered the wife of peter but how was she surprised to find her husband came to meet her said she how's this that thou alone canst walk along the path said he i've been since thou wast gone in a hot water bath now peter he began to quake as judith entered in who when she saw the mess did make a most surprising din woman i've broke my head said he and scalt my legs to boot for sure there is no need for thee to add affliction to it but said the doctor tell me sir how tis you walk about your wife affirmed you could not stir by reason of the gout then peter he related quite what we have told before then did the doctor laugh outright with loud and lengthened roar but sir said he now i suppose that all this time you've fasted pray tell me if your stomach's woes the same till now have lasted why sir said peter i must own that since from food i've rested the load is from my stomach gone and seems to be digested then said the doctor i advise when plagued with gouty pain since that's removed by exercise to scald your legs again and as you find your health increased were you but somewhat thinner i charge you twice a week at least to go without your dinner moral thus i at last have sung my song with no small care and trouble so as the fable has been long the moral shall be double and first when through excess of food you find your stomach ill then abstinence will do more good than bolus draught or pill again when pain in limbs come on so you can scarce endure it then jump about tis ten to one but exercise will cure it. End of Peter the Great Chapter 63 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian Original Fables Edwin Twas through a lone forest one wintry night young edwin was urging his steed no hamlet or cottage appeared to his sight nor a taper afar with its radiance bright nor a star pierced the gloom with its silvery light to show him which way to proceed alas thought the youth is this forest my grave how far do these mazes extend should the bleak howling tempest continue to rave unless i discover some cottage or cave unable much longer its fury to brave my life with this journey must end 
Just then a fierce gust blew the branches aside, which revealed a glad sight to our youth. For a far distant light he that moment espied. O oh, shine, gentle flame, through these dangers to guide, nor let thy faint beam to my path be denied, for I need thine assistance in truth. So cheered by the light he redoubled his pace, while the flame glided slowly along. But alas, for young Edwin, deceived by its rays, he followed the phantom till lost in a maze, and far having wandered in untrodden ways, he plunged deep morasses among. Then dismounting his steed, with despair in his breast, he resolved not to struggle again, when a faint beam of moonlight, which beamed from the west, displayed to our hero, fatigued and distressed, the path of which he had so long been in quest, but had sought mid the forest in vain. But scarce had he ventured three steps on the road, when his blood was half frozen with fear, for before him a tall slender figure there stood, which holding its arms out as wide as it could, made young Edwin believe from the form that it showed that the ghost of some person was near. Now backward with horror he started and fled, and wondered till morning arose. Then he found t'was a hand-post that filled him with dread, that a will-o'-the-wisp had his footsteps misled, and that he was like others of whom it is said that they know not their friends from their foes. End of Edwin Chapter sixty four of Aesop in Rhyme by Jeffreys Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Original Fables The Ass and the Fox. As an honest old donkey was browsing one day on the stalk of a thistle that grew by the way, a fox just returned from a dinner on goose fat saucy and full let his insolence loose so said he sorry beast is that all you can find for your poor toothless jaws at this season to grind are all the birch brooms eaten out of the land is the old bushel basket no longer at hand yet a thistle i grant ye your nature befits i dare say you find that it sharpens your wits but stay sharpen your wits that can never be done, for all the world knows that a donkey has none. But the ass, quite contented, it seems, with his diet, resolved on that head to be perfectly quiet, nor much cared as to brains that he did underrate him, yet he made this reply, and I give it verbatim. You suppose I'm a fool, neighbour fox, it is plain, think it still if you please that can give me no pain for it seems over you this advantage i have while you think i'm a blockhead i know you're a knave end of the ass and the fox chapter sixty five of aesop in rhyme by jefferies taylor this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Original Fables The Peach and the Potato. Oh, what will you say to a peach and potato discoursing on beauty of person? Yet their talk, I'm afraid, is not worse than some ladies, though not quite so soon made a verse on. Said the peach, your complexion will not bear inspection, your aspect is vulgar and homely. But my skin is much fairer, my qualities rarer, my person engaging and comely. Said the root, they judge rightly who think me unsightly, for I own that I am not an Adonis. Yet it is not my duty to envy a beauty, whose heart quite as hard as a stone is. End of the peach and the potato. Chapter sixty six of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Noel Badrian Original Fables The Show of Wild Beasts Two apes exhibited for show, some time by Mr. Polito, thinking their master did not need them, determined to obtain their freedom. So waiting till the coast was clear, one day, when nobody was near, they issued forth, and hand in hand walked for an airing down the strand. Nor were they presently espied, among so many apes beside but unmolested passed along amid the numerous monkey throng, both making sundry observations on those they thought were their relations. At last they formed the bold design some human monkeys to confine, and show them off, so says the fable, as English apes, if they were able. And so it seems, by hook or crook, six curious animals they took, and putting instantly to sea, they soon arrived in Barbary among their friends, and let them know they'd got some foreign beasts to show. These friends so thronged the exhibition that many could not gain admission. Our apes with joy the concourse viewed, and made for all what room they could. And then, as in the usual plan, they took their wands and thus began. Good friends and neighbours all, you see, after long absence here are we. We have at last our freedom gained, though fourteen years we've been detained by apes of an inferior sort, exhibited to make them sport, of whom we've now kidnapped a few to make in turn some sport for you. First you behold the English glutton, he feeds on beef, pork, veal, and mutton. But, oh, such dinners he devours, his mouth holds twice as much as ours. At once he in his stomach puts the worth of half a sack of nuts. But what is singular indeed, he never knows how long to feed, for when no longer hungry will, while food remains, keep eating still. He'll prove the truth of what I've said, if you'll but stay and see him fed. Here, said the showman, you behold, an odd young monkey, nine years old. At least, as near as I can guess, from size and strength, he can't be less. Although, were you his ways to see, you'd say he was not turned of three. I think his name, they told me once, tis, if I don't mistake, a dunce. Now, from this creature it appears, boys' wits increase not with their years. A striking difference, indeed, twixt them and us. But let's proceed. The English sloth you there may see, as usual, sound asleep is he. You'll scarce believe me when I say he sleeps all night and half the day. Tis ten or twelve before he'll rise, and hardly then can ope his eyes. I fear that now we shall not wake him, unless one goes inside to shake him. But while asleep you best behold all that about him can be told. This creature here in sickness pines. We do not understand his signs. What tis he wants we cannot tell. We never could when he was well. He says he's hungry, but the fact is, to say that is his constant practice. A form of speech he uses then, peculiar to the race of men. I can't explain it, no, not I, but I think tis what they call a lie. This is an English ape full grown, the first for your amusement shown. I fear you will not understand me when I pronounce his name a dandy. Vast numbers of this race of apes I've seen in towns of various shapes. Their brains are few, as you may guess, for all their thoughts they spend on dress. Oh, stop, not all, how fast I'm talking, for, tired of riding, tired of walking, and wishing much for something new, they thought they would combine the two. 
and tried to speed them on the road while they that odd machine bestrode you see this thing we've brought away come show the company i say this animal with doubled fist is what they call a pugilist a most uncommon creature sirs has changed his genetic characters a beast linnaeus never saw no cutting teeth in either jaw though nature gave him some no doubt but now you see they are all out his eyes once grey as i suppose you now perceive are black as sloes his nose once straight you see is broken his features cruelty betoken he is i think to say the least a frightful and disgusting beast thus neighbours we have shown you all the beasts we've taken great and small full twenty more were on their way whom we could not compel to stay indeed we got such blows and kicks the wonder is we mustered six they're few indeed we freely own out of the hundreds we have known but yet enough we feel persuaded to show that men are apes degraded End of the show of wild beasts chapter sixty seven of aesop in rhyme by jefferies taylor this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian original fables the shower of puddings said a youth to the clouds as he turned up his eyes how i wish soup and pudding were rained from the skies oh how charming twould be ready cooked if twould fall that so one might dine with no trouble at all and so it fell out says the fable at last that the sky with some odd-looking clouds was o'ercast and the south wind blew up a most savoury smell when direct from the heavens the aliments fell now the pea-soup and puddings descended amain till it poured from the mountains and deluged the plain the pigs were astonished yet did not forget like our youth while they wondered that now they might eat. however thought he i will benefit by it so he took up a piece of plum pudding to try it but alas he could not even swallow a bit for he found it was covered with gravel and grit who'd have thought it when pudding was rained from the skies that it yet would be needful some plan to devise and some trouble to take to accomplish his wish for now ere he dined he must hold up his dish but this dish was not filled quite so soon as he thought so that both his arms ached ere enough he had caught but something soon happened more dismal by half at which you'll have too much good nature to laugh for a large piece of pudding of more than a pound knocked the dish from the hands of our youth to the ground well said he i have played long enough at this game let it rain what it will it comes all to the same good things how abundant soever they be one can never obtain without trouble i see End of the shower of puddings chapter sixty eight of aesop in rhyme by jefferies taylor this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by noel badrian original fables the dog and the pitcher a true story a hungry dog as tis supposed whose form was spare and thin perceived a dairy door unclosed and straightway entered in then round about he turned his eyes on butter milk and cheese thought he i fear twill not be wise to take too much of these the milk in pans so broad and wide if lapped will clearly show it but this deep pitcher may be tried and they can scarcely know it with this he thrust his nose within and though the neck was small 
by pushing hard the prize to win he got in ears and all oh now there's room enough thought he for here the size is double and here is milk enough i see to pay me for my trouble the dog he lapped till all was gone then raised his head to go but found the jug hung firmly on to his dismay and woe vainly he tugged and backward ran the picture ran as fast then almost choked the dog began to be enraged at last with desperate blows did he assail each doorpost as he fled he that oft briskly wagged his tail now briskly wagged his head but soon the dairy maid drew near who with loud exclamations laid a good broomstick on tis clear to aid his operations at last he broke the bottom out of this disastrous jug but still the dog was not without the remnants of the mug with this the trophy of the day in haste forth trotted he and if twere ever knocked away they have not told it me moral so thieves though cunning they may be oft find themselves detected as was the dog we plainly see in ways they least expected end of the dog and the pitcher chapter sixty nine of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Original Fables The Gold Pin and the Nail. One day, as a lady was dressing in haste, by a jerk of her hand, a gold pin was displaced, which falling unseen and unheard to the floor, quickly entered a crevice to issue no more alas what a sudden reverse thought the pin but a moment before what request i was in oh how many attentions i used to engage but unnoticed i here may remain for an age unnoticed said one who had heard the remark why i've been fixed here ninety years in the dark unseen and forgotten and yet i can say that i never once wished they would shorten my stay and pray said the pin who are you by my side a tenpenny nail sir the other replied oh indeed said the pin well for persons like you i think such a residence really may do very true said the nail and i ne'er was ambitious of spheres more extended or views more propitious i'm content this old board still to hold to the rafter for ninety years more and a century after dear what a contemptible taste said the pin oh if in my place for one day you had been this deplorable dungeon i'm certain would be as disgusting and horrid to you as to me for while in this dusky old crack you have tarried to paris and brighton and bath i've been carried there used in assemblies of fashion to mix with muslins instead of oak boards to transfix but my friend said the nail it appears beyond doubt that your owner can manage your presence without but if i should my trust for one moment betray then the board that she stands on must quickly give way and if so i would ask those who foolishly rail which does the most service the pin or the nail End of The Gold Pin and the Nail Chapter 70 of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian Original Fables The Wasps and the Flies a southern wall exposed to view fine apricots of golden hue 
watched daily by the owner's care, and well he knew the number there. The wall with broken glass he strewed, if thieves should come to let their blood. But thieves there were, who still would pass, in spite of spikes and broken glass. For wasps and flies, a numerous throng, consumed the produce all day long. In vain by hand he sought to kill these thieves, too many for him still. Till vexed and angry at the pelf, and wishing for the fruit himself, a plan at last he did invent for bringing them to punishment. I'll give you all your fill, said he, then took of half-pint bottles three, and poured in each, with friendly haste, some sugared beer to suit their taste. Scarce were the sweetened lures suspended, ere swarms of thirsty wasps attended, and flies arrived from far and near, to dip each his proboscis here. At first content, as it should seem, to sip the juice about the brim, till tempted further by the smell, deluded hundreds hourly fell. In vain the flies plied hard their wings, in vain the angry wasps their stings, vainly they rode the bottle round, no solid footing could be found. The treacherous files, slippery side, with unavailing toil they tried, till wasps and flies half filled the glass, and formed almost a solid mass, on which some stood at last to try their legs and wings to rectify. But see now what a difference lies twixt angry wasps and patient flies. The wasps with many a bold essay, with fury try to force away, with hasty steps one inch attain, then falling back are drenched again, till faint, exhausted and distressed, at last they perish with the rest. Meanwhile the flies, though quite aware how great their present dangers are, convinced that Harry does belate us, stay to adjust their apparatus then try their wings a time or two, and, if they think that they will do, crawl on a dead wasp's friendly back, consider ere each step they take, with prudent care and steady creep, gently ascend the dangerous steep, contented slowly to proceed, and so, at last, get out indeed. End of the wasps and the flies. Chapter seventy one of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Original Fables Aesop's Trial. But the beasts and the birds, and the flocks and the herds, and the frogs and the toads and the mice, and the trees and the fishes, the pots and the dishes, ants, earwigs, snails, spiders and flies, these perceiving at last what a scandal was cast upon them by what Aesop recited, all mustered their strength and determined at length for a libel to have him indicted. So the court was convened, and each witness subpoened, the judge and the jury attendant. And there all alone, mounted up on a stone, stood poor Aesop, the hapless defendant. Said the judge, we'll proceed this production to read, that the jury may well understand, and then leave it to them to acquit or condemn, as strict justice they think may demand. So when this he had said, a few pages he read, nor had finished the volume or near it, when the plaintiffs and jury all rose in a fury, and vowed they'd not tarry to hear it. But who can disclose such a scene as arose, the barking, the groans, and the hisses? For said they one and all, both the great and the small, who's to bear such a scandal as this is? Said the fox, it's absurd, I ne'er spoke such a word said the frogs, we ne'er held such a tenet. said the ass, 
could I try on the skin of a lion? What a fool he must be who could pen it! Said the wolf, it must follow, with bones in my swallow, I ne'er could have made that oration. Said the crane, without doubt, if the bone I'd pulled out, you'd have made me a due compensation. Indeed, said the bear, it's too bad, I declare, to assert that I crushed his proboscis. I have something to do of more consequence too than to brush away flies from their noses. Said the jury, so clear does this libel appear, further evidence cannot be needed. Then the judge turned his head towards Aesop and said, Your defence may directly be pleaded. Then said he, I assure ye, my lord and the jury, the whole is a false accusation. Tis a libel on me, which I hope all will see, who compose this august convocation. For know one and all, both the great and the small, of these faults you were never suspected. They were not in the least meant to censure the beast, but the whole at our race is directed. Now, if in my book, with more care you will look, you must see what I mean, I'm persuaded. Seeing all the way through, I have laboured to show how far below you we're degraded. Just here I would pray what those animals say, we call donkeys, I hope no offence. When they're talking together, concerning the weather, of instinct, wit, reason and sense. Then the fable in question, at Aesop's suggestion, was read, for they could not deny it. When the beasts of all classes, especially asses, felt perfectly satisfied by it. Said the judge, what you state, I confess, has some weight. Your defence may, I think, be admitted. Said the jury, if so, the defendant may go. And old Aesop forthwith was acquitted. Moral To ourselves, it's confessed, are these fables addressed. Tis a fact not to meet with denial. And that this may be known by all readers I own, is the reason I've published the trial. End of Aesop's Trial and End of Aesop in Rhyme by Jefferies Taylor